Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how long it takes to drop the kids off, so we'll give them a couple seconds. And uh, it's really good to see you this morning. Um, if you don't know, some of you have been asking. I had a piece of my body removed uh, last week, and it's called an appendix. Come to find out, I never read the appendix in a book either, and uh, you don't need them. So, <laughs> so this morning, uh, a lot of us got to go. Uh, last week, we got to go to um, uh, some camping up on the North Cascades, which was super fun. If you've never been to North Cascades, get out there, Lake Diablo, Darrington, and farther up, Marble Mount, uh, New Halem, and drive all the way over to the other side of the mountain to a place called... Uh, Winthrop, which is this western town, which is pretty cool. You can go in there and, and probably have a gunfight on the street. I'm not sure. It, it looks like that kind of town. Uh, super fun weekend. Uh, super blessed. And, uh, and the week, week before that, I was in the hospital getting my appendix out. And I think Pastor Dave from Roots Community Church preached out in the park. And I uh, got to see that. It sounds like a, a great, great time. And it's such a blessing that we can... We can be outside. Um, the rain's coming, I suppose, so that's that's good. Uh, I love the rain, and it's good to have that back. Um, so why don't you join me in prayer? Father God, you're so, so good. Um, and so I'm just trusting in you this morning. Uh, you've you've given um, what needs to, what we need to hear. And so I just pray that we would hear that, that our hearts would hear it, that our souls would hear it, and that we'd step back and, and just take a, take a brief uh, look at our lives. Uh, and allow you to speak to us, Lord, in this. And I pray that this would be encouraging and that there would be exhortation as well and that you would do what you do best and just uh, encourage our hearts to continue um, where you're, you're directing us. And so, Lord, right here in North Seattle, I pray that you would change and transform this land as people find and discover who you are. I pray that we, as a church, would be on, that we would realize our responsibility for bringing the good news to the city and that the churches across the city who are confessing churches uh, before you would realize their responsibility to pray and to um, introduce people to you. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would transform Aurora Avenue, that you would change it and, and recreate it by recreating the people and the land. And this is this is brutally hard for us, Lord. You, you see that? You see the, the weight of it on, on us as, as your followers? Um, so I pray that you would give us the strength we need and the power we need and the, the ability and the, the uh, anointing we need for um, how you've appointed us for this. And so thank you for everyone who's gathered here and online. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Usually I, uh, I come and, and God has me write a uh, sermon out, and I actually love writing, and so I write it out on paper still. And uh, I, I, I bought a new book, and those of you who've been around for a while know that I love to journal and I love to write. I have stacks of books at home that I've written and just writing. And, and I just wanted to show you the sermon this morning. All right, it's a new book, and and this is the sermon. So I know you're thinking, oh, good, it's only going to be 15 minutes. So we better get started. <clears throat> you know, uh, we were at a prayer gathering on Thursday night, and every other Thursday night, if you don't know, there's a North Seattle United uh, churches come together to pray every other month. Uh, and this Thursday night, we were gathered together in West Side Church over in Ballard. In West Side Church, there's a pastor there, Pastor McNair, and and he was saying that they uh, were part of the Jesus movement in Seattle and gave their life to Christ 50 years ago. And he's looking around what's happening in Seattle right now, and he was saying that there's more prayer happening in the city of Seattle right now and in this region than has, than has happened in the last 50 years that he's known of. That people are getting on their knees and praying. The church is praying. People are seeking God, seeking uh, the Holy Spirit to move in the city. And even in that, that Jesus movement in the 70s, late 60s and 70s, there wasn't as much prayer as there is now. And his feeling is that God is doing something and, uh, and pushing the enemy back. And so there's a lot of prayer. And if you aren't praying, I just want to encourage you to find a place, find community people to pray with uh, and pray alone as well every time you wake up, every time you go to sleep and throughout the day as the Bible says to pray continually. 
It's really, really beautiful. And so kind of some of this has come out of that. Um, some of this has come out of camping last week. Some of it has come out of, I think, God doing some things in my own heart uh, over the years and right now, this year especially. And uh, I just want to I want to say this to you today. One of the things I love to do is is to hike. And how many of you love hiking? Trails, mountains, right? And so often we love these hiking, and we love to go up there when the sun's shining and it's bright and it's clear. You can see everything. But there's a, a certain kind of beauty of hiking in the mist, isn't there? Uh, a part of our drive back from Arizona a couple weeks ago as well, there was smoke and haze and mist and, and rain, and you could see the layers of the mountains. You look into the, the Olympics across like uh, Richmond Beach and look into the Olympics, and when the, the rain is coming across there and there's, there's clouds and there's mist and there's this, this layering of the mountains that you just see things differently, and it's really, really beautiful. Um, I love hiking, hiking up into the woods, and sometimes when it's misty and it's raining, it's kind of this this mysterious sense of the woods. It's a different way to look at the woods, and it's really, really amazing. It's really beautiful. And taking a lot of, uh, learning to take a lot of joy in seeing um, things differently. It doesn't always have to be sunny, guys, right? In fact, come to find out, most of our lives aren't just sunny. Uh, most of our lives are a bit misty, and we have a hard time discovering, trying to figure out the clarity in our lives. We're walking through life, and it's this mistiness, and and uh, I, several times when we've been out hiking, we're walking through misty woods and on a trail, and kind of you, you see just a little bit into the woods, and it's kind of just hanging there, and then all of a sudden you pop out on top, and it's clear. And the mountains are out, and the sun's there, and it's beautiful. Isn't it a part of truth that we, it's okay for us to enjoy the mist? It's okay for us to enjoy the rain and the storms and the beauty of what's happening because at some point there is clarity. I think for so many years, Christians have been trying to get clarity on Christianity, trying to get clarity on this, this book, this Bible we call it. And, and often, to tell you the truth, we are, we are messing around and we're befuddled and we're confused and we don't quite understand everything. We read it and then we have to understand it more and we seek God to tell us and help us and point to um, the truth in it. And even the religious leaders of Jesus' day were in the same boat. There's a guy named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was this religious leader. He was a Pharisee. He was a leader of, of religious leaders. And he came to Jesus at night once, and he was confused. It was like he was walking through a mist. He, he came to Jesus at night because he didn't, probably didn't want anybody to see that he was meeting with this new rabbi, this Jesus fella. And, uh, and, and he comes to Jesus, and he starts asking these questions because this this rabbi, or this uh, Pharisee, this man, this religious leader, was confused about a few things. It was like he was walking through the mist. And, and he wasn't just a, a, a guy who read the Old Testament once in a while. He wasn't a guy who studied the Old Testament. He wasn't a guy who, who went to Bible school and went through Torah and then went to seminary, and then that was it. He was a guy who studied his whole life studying the Old Testament, studying the Torah, studying, studying, studying. And he comes to Jesus, and he's a bit confused. He's just looking for a little clarity, a little clarity. Are we all looking for a little clarity once in a while? Well, even though the Bible points out a little clarity here, um, we still live life. And the enemy is the enemy of, uh, he, he's the, 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 uh, the founder of chaos, right, in our lives. And, and so, so f Nicodemus came to Jesus, and he came to Jesus here uh, in John chapter 3. He snuck in at night. He sat down with Jesus, and, uh, and Jesus gave him just a little bit of clarity. You guys know this verse. In verse 16 of chapter 3, it says this, For this is how God loved the world. And Jesus is saying, listen, Nicodemus, wise one, Here's some clarity. This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. God sent Jesus to save the world. There's the clarity. That's the clarity. And sometimes we just need to go back to the clarity, the point, the place that we know where we believed and that set a pattern, a trajectory in our life of faith. 
And often our faith lived out says a lot about our understanding of the belief that we had with Jesus. So there's a Satan fella. There is an enemy. And the enemy loves to bring, bring uh, storms. He loves to bring chaos. He loves to bring mist. He loves to bring um, confusion into our lives. And so we walk through our lives, and the world hits us at all sides, right? The world hits us, and the enemy comes against us. The enemy wants to see us uh, uh, killed, destroyed. He wants to take from us, steal from us. And, and he comes in, and he creates this chaos, and we live inside of this chaos. And, and often we get so focused on the chaos, we forget the clarity that Jesus shared with us at one point. We forget the belief spot that we began with. I don't know about you guys, um, but I have an ethos of life. Uh, do you guys have something you can write down? Like, this is me. I know this is me. Well, part of, part of me is uh, I think it probably happened when I was growing up in Idaho. I wasn't a bad kid, all right? Um, I wasn't rebellious. But I probably caused my parents a little frustration, let's call it. Because I wanted to see what was on the other side of the boundary. Like, all the time. I wanted to walk down the middle of the fence railing. I wanted to stand on the railing that was on the edge of the canyon. I wanted to see what was beyond the line, beyond the do not enter line. You know that, that line? The, the line that says, um, stop here, over there is dangerous. I want to know, why is over there dangerous? And what am I missing out on? I, I probably need to see that. I need to understand that. And if it's important enough to protect us on this line, then it's probably important enough to see, to experience. And so I was always that, that person that would jump over the fence, and, and, and I'd come up to the fence, and I'd assess it, assess the danger of it, assess the punishment I would get, and then proceed to go over. Anybody else like that here, a couple of us? So, so that's kind of where I'm at, and I think that's kind of come into my adult world. Um, we were down at the Grand Canyon a few weeks ago, and Grand Canyon is beautiful. You can go to two sides. One side's the the, uh, the native reservation there, and they've created this bridge that goes out over the canyon 70 feet, and it's glass, and it's it's really amazing because it, it sparked all of those things. It, it's beyond the do not enter line, right? And so you, you go beyond that, and you're walking on this bridge that's uh, it's glass, and you're walking around it like this big semicircle, and you look down, and it's 4,000 feet to the bottom, and your brain is just trying to capture this 4,000 feet. And Caleb and I walked out there like, this is awesome. We were walking and looking and leaning on the edge and looking over the edge. And I'm thinking, I probably should try to hang on the outside of the edge and see what happens. And so I'm trying to do that. I'm going to look around and everybody out on this bridge, people are like this, you know, like that. And I look over at Christine and she's like this. <laughs> we just paid for you to be on this bridge and you're looking at the sky. I mean, and she's over there. By the time she gets over to the edge, she, she backs off. I'm like, okay, that's all. Uh, and C Caleb and I were actually leaning over the edge. We found the farthest, farthest spot out there, 70 feet, and leaning over the edge going, wow. And your eyes are trying to figure out the depth. It's, it's so far. And, and that's, that's kind of just the ethos that I, I love. And we went to the other side of the Grand Canyon, the, the east end to the National Park, and we went to all the, the oversights and the outlooks and, and the railings, the railings. There's so many railings, so many railings. And, and I'm, if you've been to Mather Point, you know that the railing is here. And on the other side of the railing, there's these, this little like outcropping of rocks right here. And it just seems like some place you should stand, right? I didn't do it because there was a crowd behind us. So Caleb and I went down. We walked down a little bit and where the railing ended. And uh, it was just a trail. And there was a spot that went out. And it went out like the bow of the Titanic, except without water and without Leonardo DiCaprio. And we walked out there to the point, And it was, it was, so, it was so good. Because we walked out, and I felt my knees started getting weak. It was out to this point. And that, that's, a, that's a good feeling because you're, you're like at a point going, this is probably where most people would never go. We get out there, and standing on the point and turning around, right, Caleb? Our knees were like, oh, my goodness. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And it wasn't any different than standing right here, except there was 4,000 feet right there. And so that was the difference. In, and I realized in my life that that's kind of, 
this thing that God has planted in me. And I, I understand it's not everybody. And so sometimes I get frustrated with going, hey, guys, come out here. Christine was over there taking pictures on the other side of the railing. Christine, come out here and experience this, please. And, and I get frustrated wrongly that she won't, wouldn't do that. But I shouldn't, right? It's just not where she wants to be or needs to be. She enjoys her safety behind the railing. So <laughs> that's okay. <clears throat> um, not trying to be rebellious on this, right? But I know that God has put something in me that says, go a little bit farther. Where everybody else stops, go a step farther. Where, where the world stops, where my followers even stop, go a little bit farther. You see that throughout the Bible. Men and women who God calls to go just a little bit farther. In fact, go farther um, into a space that's hardly tread at all. Daniel 3. Daniel 3, I think. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The nations are bowing down to the God of the nations. He set up this big idol, and when the trumpets blow, everybody is supposed to bow down. And so the nations did, and, and around them were, were hundreds of, Thousands of people bowed down, and way over there is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, still standing, unwilling to bow to the enemy, saying, we believe in the God eternal. In fact, they they believed in him so much when they came and said, listen, we are, uh, unless you bow, we're going to put you to death. And they're like, well, here's the deal. We follow God and God alone. And we're going to go farther than anybody else is willing to go following God. And if you throw us into the fiery furnace, here's how this is going to play out. Um, we might burn up or God will rescue us. Regardless, we're going to do what God's called us to do. Regardless. And so many of us would say, I will go into the fiery furnace if I know for sure God is going to be there with me. But that's not actually what God has called us to do is men and women of God. He hasn't called us to, to go when we're confident that we're going to be saved at the end. Men and women throughout the history have gone into arenas where they are not sure of the outcome. and They've been put to death because of their faith. We just got notice of a church, the whole church has been killed. All right? Because why? They didn't they didn't repent of following Jesus, men, women, and children, all right? I hope that's not what's happening throughout the country. It might be, but over and over and over throughout the world, those kinds of things happen, all right? It's just, it's just kind of a thing that happens over and over and over, right? It calls us out to the edge, and God wants us to come out to the edge. So anyway, Jesus, Jesus was this guy, and he risked, he risked it all. He risked it all. He, uh, God sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to rescue the world. And he sent, and, and Jesus asked God himself, is like, are you going to step in here? Are you going to step in here? Because <laughs> this is hard. And Jesus even asked that the cup be passed away from him and that he, if it's possible, that the cup be passed. But he said, not, your, not my will, but your will be done. And so Jesus went forward and he, died on a cross going farther than anybody else would. He was God, and he, he went to a place for salvation for us. Okay, so I say all that, hiking in the mist and clarity, looking for clarity, going out just a little bit farther, a little, a little bit farther where God is calling us to go. And thinking about this, listen, if, is it worth it if just one person comes to know God? Is, is this entire thing, us, us being in Seattle and you being here and being part of ministry in, in, in North Seattle and being part of FCA and being part of missions groups and being part of a ministry on the street and being part of Pilgrim and, and doing this stuff, is it worth it if, if just one person knows God at the end of this? Well, I want to say absolutely. So there's clarity, there's risk, and the answer is yes. The answer is yes. 
I'm going to finish here with talking through, I, I'm going to say finish, but it's going to take a while still. Mark chapter 4, all right? Mark chapter 4 and then Acts chapter 8. Mark chapter 4 is a phenomenal chapter. And really, if Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 5 is read together, the whole thing makes a ton of sense. And uh, I shared this with our camping crew a little bit, and you guys are going to hear more. And this is just a phenomenal way that Jesus begins his ministry and then shows his disciples what's about to happen and why one matters. So Mark chapter 4. This ends, uh, Mark chapter 3, it ends with Jesus saying, anyone who does my will is my family. And so Mark chapter 4, Jesus began to teach next to the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him. And so he started to teach, and he started to teach in parables. And he would tell these stories and help people understand in parables. In this parable, he's going to talk about the, the parable of the seeds, uh, the parable of the sower, the scattering of the seeds. And so he starts telling this parable. I'm not going to read it all because there's just not enough time to read this entire thing. But he starts telling this parable about this farmer who plants seeds. And, and he'll later explain this to the disciples in verse 14 and just say that the farmer who's planting seeds is doing it by taking God's word to others. And so the farmer in this whole thing is really a perspective of us taking the word of God to other people and scattering seeds, being a farmer. Uh, Jesus would call the disciples to be fishers of men, and now he'd kind of use this um, idea of being farmers of men, if you will. And so he's saying to his disciples, he's saying to others, uh, you are the farmer and you're scattering seeds. You're scattering the word of God, the word of God, the testimony of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the clarity of John 3.16, the gospel. If you want to boil the gospel down to as clear as possible as John 3.16 and then 17. And so Jesus starts with this, this farmer planting seeds by taking God's word to others. And he said the seed is tossed out, and it's tossed out, and some seeds fell on this, this footpath that represents those, and, and, and really the footpath, it just kind of bounced off the footpath, and the birds of the air came and grabbed it and flew away with it. And the seed that fell there represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and just snatch it away and so that that message doesn't land. Often as a Christ follower and someone who wants so desperately people to see and know Jesus and scattering the seed and see it bounce off hardness and hard hearts and hard souls and see the enemy just snatch it away is something that really, it upsets me. I hate that. I want to kill those birds. The seed that fell then, some seed fell in rocky soil, and it represents those who hear the message. And the rocky soil fell down in there. It kind of starts growing, but not really. The sun hits it and, it, and it, and it scorches it. And that seed represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. And they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. And so more seed is tossed out there, and it bounces through these rocks. It bounces on the side uh, the, the pathway, and more seed, more message is tossed out, the seed that fell among the thorns, or seed that, that goes into a patch of thorns along the side there. And, and, and there's soil over there. The thorns are growing. There's weeds that are growing. And th so there's soil, and so these seeds grow, and they start growing. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent others who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by worries of life and the lure of wealth, and the desire for things, other things. And so no, no fruit is produced. It grows, it starts to look good, but it's choked out, and no fruit is produced. And, and some of us, actually, we have believed, and we've been growing in these, these weed patches, and we haven't maybe even taken care of the weeds around us. And, and we look around at the world, and the um, things of society are getting to us so much that it's starting to choke us out, and no fruit is produced. Some of us can say to ourselves right now, it's like, I know I believe in God, but there is no fruit in my life either. Way too focused on social things. And then there's seed that fell on good soil. And these represent, and those seeds that fell on good soil, it, it grabbed a hold of the ground and it was watered, it was planted and watered and uh, the sun hit it and there was no weeds around it and no birds to pick it up and, and the, the seed uh, burst and it, it started roots and it started to grow. And that seed 
The good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. So what did they hear? They heard God's good news. They heard the good news of Jesus Christ. They heard John 3.16. They believed, and it settled it and, it, and it was the end. And they didn't let other things crowd it out. And they believed, and they grew, and there was a harvest, and it was a beautiful harvest, and there was a, a, a many times the amount that was planted, the good news. Well, this chapter continues, men and women. It continues like this. Then, after Jesus explained this to his disciples, Jesus asked them, let me ask you a question. You know this about the farmer, so would anybody take a light and put it in a lamp under a basket or under a bed? Well, of course not. And many of us read these sections like they're separate somehow, but they aren't separate. Jesus is talking about the same thing. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about this. Listen, the farmer goes and, and sows these seeds. Would you take a seed and, and put it under a dark place where it can't grow? Would you, would you take the gospel? Would you take the light? He turns to this, this thought of lighting a lamp for the gospel idea. And then and would you put it under a basket and under a bed? Of course you wouldn't. Um, a lamp is placed on a stand where its light will shine. For everything that is hidden will eventually be brought to light. And he starts saying, like, this, this light is important. This gospel is important. Why would you hide it? Why would you keep it quiet? Jesus would continue, and he would actually start talking about the kingdom of God. And then two passages next, he says, how am I going to explain the kingdom of God to you? I'm trying to explain it in these parables about the seeds. I'm trying to explain it in this parable about the light. Well, how can I explain it to you? Well, it's kind of, let's, let's look at the farmer again. He scatters seed on the ground, and night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, and he doesn't even understand it. That's the kingdom of God. A piece of the kingdom of God, though, is a farmer that's actually scattering the seed. Scattering the seed. We, because often we are so afraid somebody's going to be offended by us telling them the gospel truth, we stop scattering the seed altogether. There's such a thing called relational evangelism, let's call it. Some people have coined that, I don't know. Relational re evangelism, to me, so I, I'm not into this evangelism, standing on the corner and shouting at people and trying to beat them over the head with John 3.16, because that can get pretty brutal. And some of us have seen that person, and there's no life transformation that really happens in that. That's not spreading seed. But this idea of us living our life continually, daily, hourly, minutely, on duty as a farmer. Like our relationships, every single relationship with us has a point in it where people walk away from the relationship knowing that there's something different that we've laid some seeds out, giving them some seeds, allowing God to do what he needs to do. I had a dinner, rela uh, dinner meeting last night with a friend, and he said, hey, I'm going to bring this other guy. He doesn't know Jesus, but, um, but we're, and they're doctors, eye doctors. And, and so we sat down and ate, and, and I'm like, I'll come. Um, I can't promise you I won't talk about Jesus. That's kind of just how it is. And so we sat down and started talking, and pretty soon this guy was kind of apologizing for not being a Christian in this weird way. It was kind of this, this bizarre moment where he was like, I see the, the value of this. I see what's going on in the world, and I just I want more. I want to know more, and I'll turn that over to my friend to do more. But it's just this thing, relational evangelism, right? It's like maybe we should step beyond where everybody else has stopped and continue to plant seed, even though we've seen it bounce off of some soils. We've seen it go into rocks and just die. We've seen it go into the thorns and be choked out. Maybe we just need to continue scattering the seed. And so Jesus says maybe the kingdom of God is kind of like a farmer who scatters seeds, and he just keeps doing it. He doesn't understand how it grows. The Spirit does that. The earth produces the crops then on its own, it seems like. Well, first a leaf, a blade pushes through. Then the heads of the wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it. Jesus says again, let me, let me help you understand this. How can I explain the kingdom of God? This is in verse 30. Let me try a different perspective, a different angle at explaining the kingdom of God. What story could I use to illustrate it? So he says this, uh, the kingdom of God is, is 
like a mustard seed planted in the ground. And the disciples and everybody listening knew the size of a mustard seed. It's tiny. It's, you couldn't even see it if I had it in my fingers. It's, it's that small, and it's just a small mustard seed. It's, and, and, and so he says the kingdom of God is like a mustard, is, is like a mustard seed that is planted. It's not like a mustard seed. It's like a mustard seed that is planted. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it comes up, when it grows, it becomes the largest of all the garden plants. In fact, so big that birds can land in its branches without breaking it. So the kingdom of God is like, is, is like a mustard seed that's planted and grows. That's like the kingdom of God. Somebody needs to plant this mustard seed. Jesus would continue to use parables and similar stories illustrating and, and teaching people as much as they could understand. Well, he hangs up or puts his book away as he's teaching. He hangs up the phone on that and turns to his disciples and said, hey, guys, let's go to the other side of the lake. I've talked about this passage maybe 15 times over the last 13 years because I think it's, it's a paramount description and understanding and a real happening in the lives of the disciples that if we could learn this and get it, our lives would change dramatically. There would never be another negative thing come out of our lips. There would never be another complaint about a storm in our life if we could get this. The disciples turned to Jesus. Jesus said, hey, guys, let's go to the other side of the lake. They're on the edge of the lake. They were actually in a boat as Jesus was teaching. And he says, let's go over there, the other side of the lake. I've got a picture of where that's going to be right here. You guys got that for me? The picture on the other side of the lake is, is way, it's eight miles across this this lake, the Sea of Galilee. And uh, so they got in the boat and they headed across the, the lake. Jesus is tired. And uh, in the, it, they're probably somewhere uh, wherever, on the left side of the, the lake there, and they're heading to the right side. Jesus didn't tell them where they were going or why they were going. He just said on the other side of the lake. So eight miles across, that is super deep in places. And, and there's it's super like low sea level too. It's like 700 feet below sea level. And then the depth of it goes obviously much, much deeper than that. There's hills around it, and storms are likely often around that sea. And so these were experienced fishermen, and they knew that, okay, we'll put the boats in, we'll head on across the lake. The scripture actually says that other boats went with them. Don't forget about the other boats going with them. It's just kind of a, a parentheses little thing. Other boats went with them. So listen, as evening came, Jesus said, let's cross the lake. And so they took Jesus in a boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. Jesus was tired. He went to a cushion on the front of the boat and the back of the boat there, and he put his head down on a cushion, laid there, curled up, and went to sleep. Went to sleep. A while back, um, in our neighborhood, we had some, some gunfire happen. About 30 rounds went off in our neighbor's house. None of us slept through it. <laughs> we were awake like that, right? Jesus slept through this. Storm came. It, it spread down over. You can keep that picture up there. It came down over the hills and into the water and, and came across the water, and this massive storm just hit, and it hit abruptly. And it, hit, it hit without a, any warning, and the and the disciples like, we got this, we got this, oh my gosh, we don't got this. And we're going to die. And I know Peter was out there cursing. And we think that's not godly, but he was cursing, and it was a loud cursing. And it, uh, the, other, the other guys were cursing, and people were being thrown around. The boat was being swamped, and Jesus was asleep in the boat. Get this, please get this, hear this. When there's a storm in a Christ follower's life that we've realized the, the clarity of the gospel and we've given our lives to Christ and belief has happened and faith is being walked out, in the middle of the storm, the epitome of peace is there. He's Not only Jesus is in there swamping out, he's asleep. He's peaceful in the midst of the storm. Crazy. The disciples thought they were going to die. In fact, they knew they were going to die. They've been in this situation before maybe, and this is not a good place to be. And there's other boats out here that maybe they feel some responsibility for. I don't know. 
Jesus is asleep. And so Peter runs up to him, swearing and cursing and yelling and, and, and shaking Jesus and saying, do you not even care that we're going to drown? The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, teacher, don't you care that we're about to drown? When Jesus woke up. He rebuked them. Oh, no, no, he didn't rebuke them. Isn't that nice? Jesus didn't rebuke them. Jesus woke up and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silent, be still. That doesn't always happen in our lives. Sometimes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thought they were going to go in there. If they were with God or without God, they were going to either burn up or they were going to come back out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had the image of the Son of God in the fire with them. That's what the king said. He said, didn't we put in three guys? It looks like there's four guys now. And one looks like, one looks like a god. I don't know how you, you visually discern that, but one looks like a god. And so in the middle of Shadrach and Meshach's storm, God was present. And that would change the entire world. <laughs> Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, gentlemen, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? said this a few weeks ago. He was basically calling them disciples of little faith. It was their name. Disciples of little faith. How can this, how can you still have such a little faith? I am here. I'm here. It's okay. The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. And guess what? The calmness of the sea was felt by all these other boats. They were all blessed because of Jesus as well. Kind of, kind of an idea of common grace. It's this idea in Jeremiah 29 when, when God says, enter into the city and stay there. Don't think you're going to come back out. You're in exile. You're going to stay there. Um, seek the welfare of the city because as the wealth, welfare, as you seek the welfare of the city, you'll prosper and the city will prosper and everybody will live in peace. So the powerful part, that's all powerful. The powerful part of this whole passage is verse 1 of chapter 5. And sadly, I've mourned this for many years, that verse 1 of chapter 5 is in chapter 5 and not chapter 4, verse 42, because we split it up. Jesus said at the beginning of this, after talking about the, the gospel and, and spreading seeds, he says, let's cross to the other side of the lake. And in verse 1, he says, or it says, so they arrived at the other side of the lake. Often we know where God's called us, and he sent us there, and we get into, the, and we head that direction, and we get into a storm, and we're like, oh, maybe God didn't call me. Oh, maybe something happened. Oh, maybe this is the wrong thing. Oh, my gosh, th we're going to die in the middle of, the, of this storm. This is not going to work. This is not going to happen. Oh, this is horrible. And we turn around, and we head back. If you've ever been hiking to a high mountain, there's a point where you don't want to turn back, Right? It's, it's just past that one point because it's going to be farther getting out than it is just to get to the end, right? Or there's that spot of going, we can't turn back now. The other day I ran out of gas or I was running out of gas, and I'm like, man, I need to go back to the gas station. But it's too far. It's farther back to the gas station than it is to go forward to a gas station. So you get to that point. And at some point, we have to realize as Christ followers that God sent us. So sent, since he sent us, we will arrive at the place that he sent us. It might not be the way we think it's going to turn out. We might be soaking wet and afraid and dropped a bunch of swearing on the sea in the middle of it. But God said, this is where we're going. This is where you're going to go. Well, this passage, these two chapters are really about the gospel message, about spreading the seed. It's really Jesus saying, this is the this is the the way the kingdom happens is a farmer planting seeds, is a farmer spreading seeds. It's like not putting that gospel under a bushel and hiding it. There's these, these ideas of the gospel being spread. And, and, and so now Jesus, this thing happens in the middle, and then Jesus is going to now demonstrate what it's like to spread the seed. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 go hand in hand and always must go hand in hand with the middle being a storm. So Jesus gets out of the boat on the other side. He knows what he's up to. This didn't surprise him, right? The disciples pile out from behind him, and out from the cemetery up on the hill comes this demonic man. 
You can keep reading about this in chapter 5. This demonic man, he has a legion, a thousand demons in him. He comes running down. He comes to Jesus, and he's just wild and crazy, and he's dirty. His, his hair, his nails, his, his body, he's probably completely naked. He runs down just wild and out of his mind, crazy. He's living among the cemeteries. I mean, in the tombs themselves, in the smell of the tombs where human flesh is rotting. People from the village have tried to chain him up to keep him from, from uh, ransacking them or, 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 or killing uh, their, their hogs or whatever it was. They tried to chain him up, but he's so out of his mind and so strong, he, he was able to break the chains and run and just be crazy and wild. He comes running off the hill right to Jesus and kneels at Jesus and says, why have you come to torment me? He comes to Jesus and he runs up to him, this possessed man. Jesus saw him. This is verse 6, chapter 5. <clears throat> when Jesus saw him some distance away, the man saw him and ran to meet him and bowed before him with a shriek and he screamed. And this is a guttural shriek, a demonic shriek and scream. This would terrify terrify the disciples. Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. Why are you interfering with me? This is the enemy saying, why are you interfering with me? You've come to the other side of the lake to interfere with what I've got going. I am stealing, I'm killing, and I'm destroying. I'm taking people's lives. I'm turning their lives and their brains into mash and their bodies into, into crumpled things on the side of the street, and I will take their lives before as, as I'm, but not before I torture them to death. The enemy is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. Why are you coming here to interfere with this? This is my rule, the enemy was saying. This is where I belong, among the dead and among these people, and I will control them. Why are you here interfering with me? You know, Jesus is sending us to the other side of the lake to interfere with what the enemy's doing. And I got to tell you, to get to a place where you're interfering with what the enemy's doing, you got to step beyond the boundaries. The church for so many years have put up boundaries. But you can't go there. I mean, they don't say that, but it's said. You can't go there. Not that far. Don't go there. We need to be someplace that feels comfortable and good. We need to be someplace that we're confident our children will, will be okay. Why are you interfering with me, Jesus? Jesus commands that the enemy, the evil spirit comes out of this man. And the enemy seeks Jesus' grace. They knew the power of Jesus. Jesus could send them straight to the abyss to torture and torment forever. Jesus has grace on them? I'm, I'm not sure how this is happening in this story. It's so bizarre in my mind. They beg Jesus, don't send us away to the abyss. Can we go into those pigs over there? How about that? And Jesus says, that's okay. The pigs ran over the cliff and killed themselves. I don't know where that is. But it's kind of this bizarre thing that Jesus has grace with the, the worst of the worst. God, I don't know. Do we? I mean, if we are the, the farmer who's sowing the seeds in the gospel and we are, we are out among people in this relational world that we live in, yet we can't have grace on people, what in the world are we about as Christians? What in the world do we even, how can we even walk and, and function when we know that Jesus came to the earth and he would have died on the cross to interfere with the enemy just for you personally, one person, one person. And we have the audacity to walk away from that and go, wait, wait, don't interfere with my life. I'm not going to have grace on this person or this person. I'll choose who I'm going to have grace with. I'll choose who I'm going to judge or not judge. How pathetic and crazy-minded that is. It's crazy-minded. So then all these people came out of the city. Get this crowd soon gathered around Jesus from the city there, and the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, he was sitting there 
fully clothed and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. He was sitting there perfectly sane, fully clothed. He looked like a new man who was transformed. And the people were afraid because of that. Then those who had seen what had happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and the crowd began to plead with Jesus, just go away. Leave us alone. Please leave us alone. I tell you what, when the miraculous and wonders of God starts happening, people don't know what to do with it, and they will ask, they will actually push God away often in fear because they don't know what to do with it. And Jesus turned around and left. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, Jesus, what a great opportunity to start preaching. You got all these people who are afraid out of their minds, start preaching, sowing these seeds. Let's go, sow the seeds, let's do this. Let's plant some stuff in the soil here. Let's do this, Jesus. And Jesus said, no, my purpose here is done. And he walked and he turned around and got in the boat and he left. His purpose was for one man, one out of his mind lunatic on the side of the town living in the cemetery. Just realize how close we are to a cemetery. The demon-possessed man came to Jesus and begged Jesus, can I just go with you, please? I got to get out of here. Can I be with you? Can I, can I be by your side? Can I go with you to where you are? And Jesus said, no, no, brother. Go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man didn't argue. The man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed at what he told them. The first missionary is a man who Jesus said, we're going to the other side of the lake. I'm going to describe to you and show you what it is to scatter some seed, and we're going to find the mustard seed, and we're going to plant that. And that man, that demon-possessed, crazy, out-of-his-mind mess of a man, dressed up, became sane, was transformed, and then Went to his family, I'm sure, but then went to 10 other towns, 10 cities in that area in the wilderness where nobody else was going to. The disciples didn't go there. I don't even know if the disciples went there after Jesus left. This is where this guy went. He went to these 10 towns in, in the east, and, and who knows where those, his voice went after that. If it kept going east, if it kept going, this man. I would love to know the story, the rest of the story of this man and what happened in him. The answer is yes. The question is, is one enough? Is one enough? Is one enough for us to risk our lives for? Is one enough to step over the fence and step out on the edge and look and dangle our toes on the edge and risk our lives because God has called us to the edge? Is one person enough? I'm just going to say the answer is yes. <laughs> one person is enough. One person is that mustard seed is tiny and insignificant and, and barely there, and nobody even knows. One is enough. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three was enough. These three men would step out of the fire, and the king, the pagan king, would make a new decree that everyone was not to put down the name of the living God, or they would be killed. It changed the way the entire nations looked at the king of creation. Is one enough? Well, I want to tell you, one was enough for you. If you're the one, Jesus came for you. You were enough. One was enough. One is enough. And we don't know, we don't know when we're looking at someone if that's the person that God is going to transform and change his life. And in this city, this area, we get, our hearts can get calloused towards the abuses that are against us constantly, the abuses that are there and the enemy constantly, constantly destroying and killing. The people from the city had had enough of the demon-possessed man. Jesus was just getting started. <laughs> Transformed his life into something amazing. You know what? Our only marketing plan as a church is inviting is relational evangelism, is us as people inviting others. That's it. You know, God doesn't have a plan B. His plan A is you. 
His plan A is me. We're the plan A farmers in this story of the kingdom. The seed, to spread the seed. Here's what we do often. We have a handful of seed. It's the gospel. We want desperately for somebody to know about this. And we walk and we're selective. We're like, "Ah, there might not be enough. Or I'm kind of embarrassed talking to this person. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the seed to somebody else. We're selective on those seeds. One, maybe it'll grow there. Maybe it'll grow. Oh, that person would make a great Christian. Oh, that is that like pains my soul. I don't know about you, but it pains me. Jesus said he, the, the farmer scattered the seed. He took this handful of seed and he went like that. He went like that. Like that. Allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work of growing. Growing. Basically, evangelism, men and women, is saying, I actually have this written down. That's why I'm reading it. It says this. It says, I care for you. Come and see. I think this man, I think he just went to the ten cities and go, listen, look at me. <laughs> I was this. I was this guy. I was like this dead. I was dead. I was like literally like my, I was dead. I was dying and dead and in suffering and pain. This is who I was. I was like this gross human. That, and look at me. I've been transformed, and it wasn't even me who did it. I just believed. Here I am. He said, come and see this. Isn't that what one of the disciples did to Nathaniel sitting by the tree and said, we found the Messiah. Come and see. Come and see. I want to encourage us as a church to be part of God's plan A. <laughs> Invite. Seed. Seed. Come and see. I, I care for you so much. Will you come and see? You know, many of us care for other people. If there was a, if Les Schwab was, had a tire sale and it was a dollar a tire, we'd all be like, where's my friends? <laughs> Let's go to Les Schwab and get a dollar a tire right now. This is awesome. Come and see. I care for you. Let's get your car fixed. Let's do this, right? The same thing, except just infinitely greater. Eternal salvation. Infinitely greater. Transformed heart. God, I praise you that you know what we need online or here sitting among uh, this this space lord i i praise you that you know what we need and, and you know the where our hearts really need to be honest with ourselves many of us just aren't willing to to celebrate the storm lord may we get to a place where we realize that the storm is just taking us to where you want us to go in a lot of ways. It's just strengthening us. It's giving us more power and authority and influence, and it's putting us in a different place where we're able to speak with confidence. Storms give us confidence. I pray that we would repent of being known as speaking in a negative light. I pray that we would pr- repent as Christians for being known as people who don't pray. May we repent as Christians of being known of being selective in our sowing. May we repent as Christians of judging others and looking and saying, eh, eh. <clears throat> I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would look at ourselves as a man on the other side of the lake woman on the other side of the lake that you would risk everything to get there for that one person Lord I pray that sitting right here that you would you would tap on our hearts say brother sister you're the mustard seed you're a mustard seed step out farther than anybody else would, farther than we were trusting you. We'd step into the fiery furnace whether you show up or not. Men and women, Jesus
Jesus did that for you. If you're hearing this online, you're sitting here, Jesus went farther than anybody else would. He went to the other side of the lake, but it wasn't just a storm with water. It was torture. It was destruction of his heart and his soul, his body. Destroyed him. He died on a cross to get to the other side of the lake, to get to you. If you haven't come to him at night like Nicodemus did, I know it's been cloudy. I know it's been hard to understand. But if you haven't come to Jesus at night and said, I need clarity. Friend, here's your clarity. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will have eternal life, will not perish. God didn't come into the world to judge the world, but to love the world give to transform God would you help us to respond as Justin